Tonight, the unprecedented immigration measure, a new cap on temporary residents. Aimed at the affordability crisis. Canada's future economic vibrancy depends on those we bring in today. Targeting international workers and students. There's so much talk about numbers and caps and not enough conversation about rights. Apple accused of illegally monopolizing the market. A landmark lawsuit against the tech giant. Unlawful exclusionary behavior. Also, a step towards justice for two men switched at birth in Manitoba. We sincerely apologize. Number 17, Shohei Otani. Plus, baseball's biggest star, now overshadowed by a scandal involving his interpreter's massive gambling debt. It's a clear violation of, of the league's rules. And a paralyzed patient plays online chess with his mind. It has already changed my life. A major medical reveal. Elon Musk's tech startup shows its first patient using its brain chip. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with a major change in who is eligible for a job in this country. For the first time, Canada is capping the number of new temporary residents arriving here, including low-wage foreign workers. There are currently 2.5 million temporary residents in Canada, representing about 6% of the population. That's a surge of about a million in just three years. CTV's Judy Trin on the reason for the pivotal policy change and which sectors facing critical labor shortages are getting an exemption. Record lineups at food banks and shelters across Canada. Many struggling to make ends meet are being passed over for work. 1.2 million Canadians out of work and a 650,000 vacancy. So what it, why is that? There's an issue of skills mismatch, geography mismatch. People are not actually reaching out to Indigenous people, to persons with disabilities, to women, to racialized women, to, to us LGBTQI people. To push businesses to hire domestically, the federal government is limiting the number of people who can be hired from outside Canada. Starting in May, employers will have to rely on fewer foreign workers. Only 20% of a company's staff can come from overseas, down from 30%. Only the housing and healthcare sector, which have big labor shortages, are exempt from the new cap. The agricultural sector also won't be impacted for now. There's always more that we can do to support a successful immigration to Canada and notably ensure that those who choose to make this their home are set up for success. The policy is expected to benefit new immigrants, refugees and asylum seekers, among them 300,000 Ukrainians who have arrived in Canada since Russia's invasion. Analysts say newcomers often lose jobs to foreign workers hired at cheaper wages. Part of the reforms here is actually making sure that, that immigrants to Canada have an opportunity to participate in our economy and make sure that and to ensure that they and their families can thrive. But the group representing migrant workers say they're being scapegoated for economic woes when they need protection. They're being abused by their employers, they're being mistreated by their landlords because they don't have permanent resident status. Earlier this year, the federal government capped the number of international students. Combined with this cap on foreign workers, the government hopes to reduce the number of temporary residents to 5% of Canada's population by 2027. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Moving on to a major development in the U.S., the Justice Department has joined 16 states and the District of Columbia in a sweeping antitrust lawsuit against Apple, accusing the tech giant of boxing out the competition. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. In the 88-page complaint, the Justice Department alleges that Apple violated federal antitrust laws through the iPhone, Apple Watch, and Apple Pay systems. It also claims the smartphone company with more than a billion iPhones worldwide, quote, deliberately makes its products less compatible with its competitors' devices. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps, and accessories, 
and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. Apple, in response today, called the lawsuit, quote, wrong on the facts and law. Lawmakers in this country had to decide today whether or not to topple Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's minority government. But ultimately, the non-confidence motion pushed by the opposition conservatives over the carbon tax failed. Here's CTV's Michael Couture. I declare the motion defeated. With that, the Liberal government survived the non-confidence motion. The result was predictable because of the supply and confidence agreement between the Liberals and NDP. But with the price on carbon expected to rise in 11 days, the Conservatives used the divisive policy to force a vote and debate earlier in the day. If the Liberal government believes that everyone loves the carbon tax, then why won't they agree to go to the polls? What are they scared of? That led to a full-throated defense of the now-renamed Canada Carbon Rebate and some pointed accusations across the aisle. What these folks are going to do is make poor people poorer and they are going to essentially sacrifice the future of our children going forward. Shame on you! While the result was a given, some see the move as a way for the Conservatives to try and paint the NDP into a corner ahead of the next election. Where Conservatives can say, we don't believe in Justin Trudeau, we don't believe in the carbon tax, the NDP are standing with Justin Trudeau and standing with the carbon tax, so the NDP will have a lot of explaining to do. Members of the NDP didn't see it that way. What we've seen from the Conservatives is that they have absolutely no climate plan. They also have no plan to support Canadians as they are struggling with the cost of living. The supply and confidence agreement is set to expire in just 15 months, with an election expected shortly after that. And today's vote makes it clear the Conservatives are already in campaign mode. Omar? All right, Mike, thank you. Another dramatic scene in Newfoundland and Labrador today, where the government finally released its budget a day after it was postponed because of a chaotic confrontation outside the legislature. But the governing Liberals were speaking to themselves in the House of Assembly after opposition parties didn't turn up, instead speaking with demonstrators outside, who again protested today. CTV's Garrett Berry on the continuing clash. Once again, Newfoundland and Labrador's legislature, a hot spot for protests. Officers in riot gear, shields, masks, staring down hundreds of protesters. So, like, what, what is it all about? You've caught nothing here this morning for aggression, nothing like that, and we're dealing with this. I've, I've just never seen this in my little province. Inside, government officials tabled their budget. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Premier, that this House approve. Officials slept here overnight to make sure they could deliver their speech on time. They had a little camp out, I guess. It's the fanciest campground in, in Canada, I guess. But their audience was missing. Opposition politicians boycotted the proceeding. They stayed outside instead, speaking with protesters. The Premier and his Minister of Fisheries led people to, to conclude that they, they heard us and they're actually going to do something and we find out that nothing was done. Yesterday, a chaotic day on these grounds. Police tried to push their horses into the crowd of protesters. Two people were injured in confrontations, one officer and one harvester. Today, protest leaders urge demonstrators to keep their cool, but keep pushing their message. Can we have the meeting? Can we have it now? Can we get this put to bed? Can we all go home? Protesters are demanding less government regulation and more freedom in when and where they can sell their catch. Today, no ambulances were called to the site, but protesters seemed to ignore court injunctions. One civil servant was pushed away as he tried to enter the building. Organizers say they anticipate meeting with provincial officials tomorrow, but they're still asking fish harvesters to come back here in the morning to demonstrate and show their strength. Garrett Berry, CTV News, St. John's. Canadians paid tribute to former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney in his home province of Quebec today, where he is now lying in repose at Montreal's St. Patrick's Basilica. One of them was former Bloc Québécois leader Lucien Bouchard. The two men started out as friends, but became bitter political rivals. Mulroney even reportedly told friends that if Bouchard showed up at his funeral, the service was to be stopped. But Bouchard recently said they had resolved their long-running feud. Of course, it's a very emotional moment when you turn a page on history. The Mulroney family again greeted well-wishers today. 
who shared their memories of the former Prime Minister. And we will be broadcasting live from Montreal tomorrow and on Saturday. CTV will have special coverage of the state funeral for Brian Mulroney starting at 9 a.m. and online at ctvnews.ca. Two Manitoba men born on the same day at the same place and then separated from their biological families received an apology from the province. An apology decades in the making. Here's CTV's Alison Bamford. Richard Bouvet. I am sorry. Edward Ambrose, I am sorry. A mistake that once kept these two men from their biological families has now brought them together for an official apology. On behalf of the Manitoba government, we sincerely apologize for our failure to care for you. Words Edward Ambrose and Richard Beauvais unknowingly waited to hear their entire lives. You put everything at peace. Ambrose and Beauvais were born in the same hospital on June 28, 1955, in Arburg, Manitoba. For decades, they thought they went home with their biological parents. It's emotional uh, for meeting someone who, who is you, but I am him. A mix-up at the hospital meant Ambrose was raised by a Ukrainian family and Beauvais grew up thinking he was Métis. At-home DNA tests proved they were switched at birth, leaving the men and their families with a lifetime of catching up to do. It's interesting to meet people who technically you're not blood-related to, but you instantly become family with. Not just new family members, the men are also being introduced to a new identity. For Ambrose, he's gaining an entire Métis culture, which Manitoba's Métis Federation says can be a challenge for anyone reclaiming their heritage. It is a hard, hardship for sure. I've heard the stories from so many families, and, and, uh, but I also hear the stories of such great uh, feeling of pride knowing that they're home now and they belong where they belong now. The family's lawyer met with the government to discuss the potential for any compensation. This is the third known case of babies being switched at birth in Manitoba, and the premier says his government is willing to look into it further. Alison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Egypt today for talks focused on the Israel-Hamas war. We would get our experts together in the coming days uh, to identify the urgent, practical, and concrete steps that can and should be taken to increase the flow of assistance. Israel needs to do more. The visit comes ahead of a new U.S. resolution at the United Nations, which will, for the first time, call for an immediate ceasefire in the war. It's a shift for the United States, which has vetoed the three previous U.N. resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Back here at home, Vancouver's mayor and police chief held a rare joint news conference after a frightening series of random attacks, all in the middle of the day, most downtown, and one in a busy city park. Here's BC Bureau Chief Andrew Johnson. It was a shocking sight, a daylight stabbing during the lunch hour in downtown Vancouver. I saw a gentleman running for his life down the street. He was like, I need to get out of here. Like, it was just chaos. Guns drawn, officers moved in, tasered and arrested a man. Witnesses say had been attacking people at random on Wednesday. Today, this message from the mayor and the police chief to a city left rattled. We understand your anxiety and your concern. The safety of Vancouverites and tourists and visitors is non-negotiable. Incidents like the one that happened yesterday are disturbing, but I can assure you that despite these challenges, Vancouver is a safe city. Challenges that also include a sexual assault in Stanley Park on Monday morning, a woman attacked on a trail. And last week, a senior waiting for a SkyTrain pushed into the train as it arrived and rushed to hospital. Police say the man now facing charges in Wednesday's rampage, Kent Meads, had been released from a BC jail just days ago. Previously, he'd been in custody in Thailand for allegedly smashing his way into a bank. There appears to be mental health issues at play. The mayor, who campaigned on beefing up police, also points to problems he says you can't just arrest your way out of. Vancouver continues to grapple with a mental health crisis that requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. 
including the federal government. The other message today from Vancouver's top cop is statistically violent crime and stranger attacks in the city are actually down. But stats may not do much to calm fears, with people seeing so much daily violence unfolding right in front of their eyes. Andrew Johnson, CTV News, Vancouver. Coming up. You've got a very high-profile client in now a very high-profile story. A baseball star, his longtime friend, and the alleged stolen millions. Plus, Pushing Frontiers, an online game of chess like never before. Fresh off signing the biggest contract in North American sports history, baseball superstar Shohei Otani has found himself at the center of a firestorm. His longtime friend and interpreter was suddenly fired by the L.A. Dodgers amid allegations of massive theft and illegal gambling debts. Here is CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the scandal. Here is Otani and Musgrove, and he rips one. He's unquestionably the biggest name in baseball. A two-run homer, Shohei! And now, Shohei Otani's name has come up in a U.S. federal investigation into illegal sports gambling. The Dodgers have one employee potentially stealing from another who also happens to be their most prized player. The Los Angeles Dodgers have fired the Japanese superstar's longtime interpreter and friend, Ipe Mizuhara, after questions surrounding at least $4.5 million in wire transfers sent from Otani's bank account to an illegal bookmaking operation set off a firestorm of events. Otani is now trying to deal with the distractions. An investigation by ESPN has uncovered that Mizuhara was betting on sports through a Southern California bookie who's under federal investigation. Initially, a representative said Otani had transferred the funds to cover his interpreter's gambling debt, though that story has since changed, with the baseball superstar's legal team sending out this statement saying, in the course of responding to recent media inquiries, we discovered that Shohei has been the victim of a massive theft, and we're turning the matter over to the authorities. The first thing that goes through people's minds is, oh my goodness, was this a stand-in for a player actually doing gambling? And there, let's be clear, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere in the public realm to suggest that's the case. Sports betting is illegal in the state of California. If Mizuhara is to blame, it begs the question. How did he get access to Otani's millions? You've got a very high-profile client in now a very high-profile story, you've got to be in serious damage control mode now. Oddly, Otani and his interpreter could be seen smiling together in the dugout just yesterday during the Dodgers' season opening game in Seoul, South Korea, where the organization refused to answer any questions. Can't comment. Sorry. Were, were you surprised when you found out he was fired when that happened? Again, can't say anything. I'm not going to comment, guys. With Major League Baseball said to be investigating along with federal authorities. It might be some time before we ever hear from Otani. But one thing's for sure, this story is far from over. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, a medical milestone with major implications. Following um, years and years of study, decades of study, months of planning and hours of surgery, hope became a reality for our patients. The historic transplant of a pig's kidney into a human. A pioneering medical feat in Boston, where doctors successfully transplanted a pig's kidney to a man. The kidney pinked up immediately and started to make urine. When we saw the first urine output, Everyone in the operating room burst in applause. <laughs> it was truly the most beautiful kidney I have ever seen. The animal was genetically modified to remove genes that could be harmful to a human, and the results appear promising. The patient is expected to be discharged soon, within a week of surgery. Well, some frightening video from Minnesota after a hot air balloon blew into a power line and then crashed along a highway. The pilot had been trying to land in a field Wednesday when a gust of wind pushed the balloon into the wires. The basket fell. Thankfully, none of the three people on board suffered any serious injuries. The power line sparked a brush fire that was quickly extinguished. And some tense moments for a group of tourists on a safari in South Africa.
A bull elephant lifted their truck at a national park northwest of Johannesburg. Terrified tourists took cover between the seats. The 22-seater was picked up several times during the standoff. Fortunately, no injuries. Quite the scare. Still ahead, a major medical reveal. I had to use like a mouth stick and stuff, but now it's all, uh, it's all being done with my brain. If y'all can see the cursor moving around the screen, that's, that's all me, y'all. Um, it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Meet the recipient of a brain chip developed by Elon Musk's tech startup. From electric cars to rocket ships and plans to colonize Mars, billionaire Elon Musk is also pushing medical boundaries. He says his startup company Neuralink has successfully implanted its first wireless brain chip into a human. And on his social media platform X, he introduced us to his patient. Here's CTV's Joy Melbourne. The first ever user of the Neuralink device. Meet 29-year-old Noland Arbaugh, paralyzed from the shoulders down after a diving accident eight years ago. He describes his new abilities as a kind of telepathy, like something out of the movie Star Wars. Basically like uh, using the force on the cursor <laughs> and I could get it to move wherever I wanted, just stare somewhere in the screen, um, which was such a wild experience. Let me just flip the camera around. In a video stream, Arbaugh shows how he plays online chess, directing uh, the cursor to move um, with his I mind. Play. It's all being done with my brain. If y'all can see the cursor moving around the screen, that's that's all me, y'all. Um, it's pretty cool, huh? After years of controversial testing on animals, Neuralink was cleared for human trials. Billionaire Elon Musk hopes to commercialize his device. The chip, about the size of a coin, implanted in the skull, reads neural activity in the brain, beaming it back to a computer, transforming thought into action. So you can operate a computer or a smartphone by simply thinking. So you can think about ways that people can get back abilities that they've lost, but there's no reason not to think outside the box. If you can move a mouse on the screen right now, you can envision a future where you can drive a car with this stuff, right? I mean, this is this could completely change everything. Neuralink is just one of a number of companies and universities working on this type of technology. Our boss says it isn't perfect. There are challenges, but it has changed his life. Just wanted to help. Um, I wanted to be a part of something that I feel like is going to change the world. A first step, merging mind and machine and giving hope to many. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See you all later. Joy Bye. Malvin, CTV News, Washington. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow from Montreal. CTV National News. Canada's number one newscast.